everybody. So I just thought I'd tell you a, a tiny bit about myself. So I am, my major area of research interest is language development and language in children with developmental disabilities. And my colleague, Stefka, is a bilingualism expert. So occasionally, actually quite often recently, we work together <laughs> and our, our interests overlap. So I'm going to start us off talking about uh, this uh, international study that is not specifically about children with autism, but of course includes them and is about educational opportunities that are available for children who are growing up bilingually. And then Stefka will follow with a, a report on the results from two specific studies about children with autism. So this busy slides with all the logos is just to <laughs> reflect the fact that many people are involved in this project. And it, so it's a multi-site project uh, with sites in Canada, the US, and Europe. And the, the principal investigator of this project is Elizabeth K. Reiningberg at Dalhousie University in Halifax. For the Vancouver site, Stefka is actually the site leader. And as Pat said, uh, she and I have also been involved in this project. So the, the project is about finding more about the context in which children who are uh, with the, the context in which children who are develop, have developmental disabilities are growing up when they are bilingual or their parents would like them to be bilingual. So before telling you a bit more about this study, just a little bit of background. So Bilingualism is not an exception. It's actually, in many places around the world, the norm. And it's certainly not a rarity uh, in the Vancouver area, but in many places, certainly. And there are increases in migration that are leading to even larger numbers of persons in our countries who are, speak more than one language. So inevitably, some of those people are going to be children who have developmental disabilities. So we're interested in understanding better the context in which these children are growing up and the, the services and supports that are available to them in that context. We're using a broad definition of bilingualism in terms of thinking about people who need and use two or more languages in their everyday lives. So this definition uh, was proposed by Grosjean, and it's a broad, inclusive definition that really focuses more on language use than language proficiency. And that is particularly important, perhaps, when we're thinking about children with developmental disabilities and can apply, really, to anyone, regardless of their level of proficiency. There certainly isn't a single way to be bilingual. There are many different factors that will influence what that experience will be and how one might become bilingual or their everyday experiences. These are just some of the, of the factors we can consider. They include uh, proficiency in one, both, or however many languages someone speaks. How often that person is using their languages and hearing them, which will also vary. When each of those languages might have been learned uh, in infancy, later on in life. Uh, the societal value that is placed on those languages is not the same for all languages. So sometimes we talk about majority languages, minority languages. Um, in Canada, we have sometimes a situation where we have a minority language that's an official language, if we think about English in Quebec or um, French in BC, for instance. And then the types of schooling that uh, are available or that um, you know, the various choices that are presented. Sometimes there are dual language programs that can support bilingualism, cases where there's immersion, or even in many places there's an opportunity to learn an additional language uh, uh, throughout one's schooling. And these various factors might lead to someone being in a context either of additive or subtractive bilingualism. So a context of additive bilingualism would be one where someone has a first language and we're learning another language or more than one, one other language would be in the context where the first language continues to 
develop or be preserved. And subtractive bilingualism would be a context where learning a new language would be at the expense of a, a prior language. And something else that is a, important perhaps to think about is that there's differences in terms of whether or not bilingualism is a necessity or uh, something that's ne that is uh, almost unavoidable. So if we think about um, uh, some children who enter school, for instance, not knowing the language of instruction, well, they're, the, they're going to have to learn that language to be able to, to attend school and to do well. So they would be in a context where becoming bilingual is really a necessity. But there's also, there are also situations where uh, the parent of a child who has a developmental disability might, although that child might at home speak the same language as the language of instruction, parents might still uh, wish to give their children opportunities to become bilingual and consider it a form of enrichment and an asset for them looking uh, from a long-term perspective. So that applies to all children, but certainly as well to children with uh, developmental disabilities. And I should, probably should have said this before, but we're using this term children with developmental disabilities to describe children broadly who may have autism or an intellectual disability or Down syndrome or a language impairment or a reading impairment. So a, a broad definition here as well. Now, Stefka is going to talk about this more uh, in her part of the presentation today, but there's starting to be quite a bit of evidence that children with developmental disabilities can actually grow up in bilingual contexts without that exacerbating their language difficulties, um, at least in some, in some situations. So that's what uh, Stefka's presentation will give us more evidence about. Okay, so back to this big multi-site study. So it had many goals. Um, at the start, the it was to actually review the literature about what we know about the, the, the context and the outcomes of children who are, have developmental disabilities and are in bilingual situations to describe those contexts. But Today what I'm going to present about will focus on the data that we have that, can, that speaks to access and participation for these children to bilingual services and programs. Overall, the project was meant to give us more understanding and information, but also set, set the groundwork for future studies. Today I'm going to focus on two aspects of this, of this larger study. One, which is telling you a bit about the policies that are in place in the various sites that were covered in, the, in this um, multi-site study. Um, try not to make it too dry, but I think that although policies aren't particularly exciting, they're certainly important in terms of giving us uh, some information about what the lay of the land is and what generally is likely to be the context in which these children are going to be, have opportunities to, be, to support their, the various languages they know and to become bilingual. And then I'll tell you about uh, another aspect of this study where interventionists who work with children in, in either in, in clinics, in preschool settings or in school settings were surveyed to find out what is actually happening in their workplaces and what their opinions are regarding both the services and the and uh, bilingualism for these children. There's another uh, aspect of the study that I will not get, go into detail to reporting on today, which was uh, interviews that were done with key informants at various sites and. Uh, Occasionally throughout the presentation, I'll just uh, use a few quotes to, to support or contrast with the information we got from the policies and the survey data. So what were these sites? So the study has, took place in three sites in Canada, Vancouver, Montreal, and Halifax. 
and one site in the US, which was Albuquerque, New Mexico, and then in Manchester in the United Kingdom, and in the Netherlands, generally, but uh, also in a town, in a city called Nijmegen. So I won't go into detail about these sites, but generally, um, for most sites, well, for the three Canadian sites, as, as we know, there's two official languages. In Vancouver and Halifax, the, the dominant language is English. And in Montreal, it's, it's the reverse, where the majority uh, language is French. And then in Albuquerque and Manchester, English is also the majority language. And in Nijmegen, it's Dutch. And if you look at the column with the red numbers, that, that's the per percentage of people who speak a minority language. And generally, you can see that those percentages are quite high uh, across sites in the 25% and more, with the exception of Halifax, where uh, it's actually um, English monolinguals uh, make up, well, people who speak English make up over 90% of the population. And in Vancouver, well, we win the prize, 45%, which may or may not surprise you. All right, so what about those policies? What did we learn by looking at the policies? So the goal was to get a sense of what the policies are that might influence children in terms of whether or not they're likely to become bilingual and are in, might be in context of subtractive or additive bilingualism. So we looked at policies that on the one hand were about special education and on the other hand language and education policies. So these are policies that might have to do with the, what the languages are, the choices around language of instruction, support for, for that language, uh, access to other languages in terms of immersion or as, um, as subject matter. So we reviewed government documents of, from at many levels and of various types in education, but not exclusively. And uh, this was done across the various sites. So I'm going to present the results in three parts. First, about, about special education policy. So what did we learn? Generally, all sites support inclusion on the one hand, and individualization on the other. So support for that inclusion. Um, as an example here, this is a quote from an interviewee in Montreal who said, we follow an inclusive model so students are members of the regular classrooms. They may be pulled out from time to time to get extra help in English or French. And in Halifax, someone said, cannot refuse, do everything they can to offer the child the best education possible. So the interview data also supported what we found in the policies generally. Now there's more variability regarding uh, differentiated instruction or adaptive teaching. And policies at four of the sites explicitly mentioned that. There was no explicit mention of that in Vancouver, although um, in terms of, it wasn't at the level of policy, but actually there was a, quite a bit of mention in that it's important to have adaptations and that adaptations are part of the IEP. So these adaptations are also regularly referred to as best practice. And in Albuquerque, what they talk about there is the least restrictive environment. So the idea that it depends on the child. So what, how inclusion is actually uh, realized will depend on each child and where they're at in terms of what is the best environment from them, being in the classroom all the time with some supports or in, uh, with, uh, in a specialized context. So generally we see we have this general, these policies that generally talk about inclusion with adaptations. But when you look at data regarding how many children are actually in the regular classroom most of the time, there's actually quite a bit of variation across sites. And I just highlighted here that in Albuquerque it's quite variable, and in Nijmegen it's actually quite low. So sometimes with similar policies, you can still have different realities or, or practices. So turning now to language and education policies, if we consider supports for the language of instruction, so we know as a starting point 
that some children are going to enter school with limited knowledge of the language of instruction. So if we take that as our start point, then there are some that the, these children are in a context where they have the obligation, but we could also say the opportunity to become bilingual, uh, in that they're going to at some, need to learn the language of instruction. And this also includes children with developmental disabilities. So presumably the supports that they get for that language of instruction is likely to affect how well they do, or whether their outcomes are more or less positive. There was actually quite a bit of variability in terms of how the supports that were provided for the language of instruction across sites. So at one end of the spectrum, we have Manchester and Nijmegen. Both of these sites actually left it ver the responsibility very much up to teachers or the local level of decision making to decide how to, uh, to support and to implement the support for the language of instruction for children, which is quite a bit to expect, I think, from, from classroom teachers. Um, then if you look at Montreal, at least in, when it comes to uh, French school districts, there's what are called um, transition or welcome classes that offer up, up to two years of intensive support to learn French. So that's an quite a contrast from those other sites. And then the, in the middle, there's uh, more flexibility. So uh, in Halifax, it can be from consultation to intensive, which is similar to what we see in Vancouver. And in Albuquerque, there was some yeah, English second language support on a daily basis. So it varies from uh, quite intensive, flexible to it really depends. So what about support for minority languages? So if we think about unofficial minority languages, there's actually very minimal support across sites and it's generally not considered, it's not really part of policy and left more to local initiatives or, or that are external to the educational system and they might not actually be publicly supported. The situation is a bit different when we consider official mi minority languages such as French or English in Canada and or in, in um, the Netherlands there was also a, a minority language called Frisian which also has some support. And then there is some uh, opportunity or support for indigenous languages but that really varies depending on the, the the specific place in Canada or the US, and uh, there's some, for instance, bilingual programs, English Navajo programs in, in Albuquerque, and some indigenous groups in Nova Scotia and Quebec actually have jurisdiction over education. So for, for official or indigenous languages, there, there can be some support, but not, ter not really for other minority languages. Um, when it comes to learning another language, so opportunities for optional additive bilingualism. So for a child who might already speak the language of instruction, but to be able to learn other languages. So at the very, in various sites, there was opportunities for immersion or, or intensive language classes. In the three Canadian sites, there was French immersion or French English bilingualism in Montreal and Mandarin immersion programs are, are, uh, exist in some school districts and schools here in Vancouver. There, was some bi there were some bilingual programs, Dutch English programs in the Netherlands, but those are exceptions. And then in Albuquerque, there are also some examples of bilingual programs that some children might be able to access. It's certainly uh, not everyone, but there is that opportunity for some children. And then language classes as subject matter, so learning Spanish, learning German, learning English, or learning French as an additional language as subject matter was present in all sites in, except for Albuquerque. So what we were really interested in looking at though is the intersection between the, the policies for children who, with special needs or with developmental disabilities on the one hand and policies around around language and language of instruction or support for language on the other. So 
When it comes to explicit statements of language learning opportunities in special education policies, they were rarely there. So in theory, inclusion suggests that there sh shouldn't be any discrimination or barriers to uh, learning other languages for children with special needs. But it's, those are not, that's not explicitly stated in policy. Although, again, if we consider an inclusionary perspective, there sh there's, those opportunities should be present. Occasionally, there was mention of language in, about talking about kids with developmental disabilities when we were looking at policies around language and education. For instance, there's certainly the recognition that children can receive support both for language of education and special education services, so that these two things aren't incompatible. Uh, there's also the possibility for children to opt out uh, from second language classes, generally at the request of the parent. Generally, what we found is that policies are, at all sites include principles that children should be included in the educational, regular educational classroom, should be able to access the full range of educational opportunities, and that they might need support to do that. We saw there was a lot of variability, however, in how many children spent most of their time in regular classrooms. And that rarely did policies that dealt with, that dealt with bilingualism explicitly talk about children with developmental disabilities. So that could result, on the one hand also, if we think that there's not much support for many of the, of the home languages, if those are minority languages, there's more or less support for the language of instruction. If you put those two things together, well, that means that all children, but perhaps even more so those with developmental disabilities, might be at risk of losing their first language with you know, costs in terms of what that could mean for the child and, and the family in terms of... Uh, losing their first language. Also, it could mean they don't have a strong first language to learn their a second language. And if they don't have, on top of that, strong support for language of instruction, they could be at even greater risk of academic difficulties. We also saw that learning a second language was more option, that was um, a, a second language that was optional. Those supports were, were not really explicitly stated. And also there is some evidence too that policies don't always translate into practice. There's some indication that actually uh, French immersion is often, often caters to children who might have, be high achieving or from, from high socioeconomic status. And there's also, from the interview data, we got uh, uh, the impression also, and also many of us have heard this, that it's often up to the parents to ask for access to language classes or for immersion in particular if their child has a developmental disability. That's what the policies state and now I'm going to tell you about the results from our survey study where people who work with children in, these, in uh, preschool clinics and schools and tell, report about what they told us is actually going on where they work and what their opinions are. So. We wanted to get information about practices and opinions. We sent out surveys via multiple agencies and invited people to participate. And as I've said, people were school and clinic-based professionals. Um, in five of the sites, the, the where the people, the language that people reported was the language of their workplace matched the majority language. So Dutch in the Netherlands and English in Vancouver, Halifax, New Mexico, and Manchester. Uh, in Montreal, although there was an effort made to try to get respondents who were both in French-speaking and English-speaking workplaces, we only had enough respondents in the end from people who work in sites where the, the language of the workplace is English. So it's just important to keep that in mind in terms of interpreting the data from Montreal. So most of the survey questions offered the opportunity for people to answer on a five-point scale, a Likert scale. When it was an opinion question, they, a practice question, how does this happen, they, they could answer from always to never. 
And when it was an opinion question, it went from strongly agree to strongly disagree. And for the various questions, they were asked to, an, asked to answer for five different groups of children. So if you take this example of a question for sequential bilingual, bilingual children, so children who, are, uh, who have a, a home language that's different from the language of instruction, they were asked to, to answer whether these children could currently receive supports and to answer for children who are typical, children who have mild autism or a mild intellectual disability, children with severe autism or severe intellectual disability, children with a language or a reading impairment only, and the fifth group was children who use AAC, regardless of diagnosis. So I'm going to tell you about, in this report, only s some of the data, but that talk about practice items, about whether children who are typical or who have developmental disabilities have access to service and supports to learn the language of instruction and have access to language classes and additional languages. And also, what are people's opinions about that? And also, what is their opinion regarding whether children have the capacity to learn more than one language? So although I told you that they had to, oh, that's strange. Oh well, I don't know what's happening, but there were, <laughs> although I said there were five, that respondents were asked to answer for five groups of children, the data actually pattern in a way where we group the, them into typically developing children, children who, that we call a mild group, that group children with mild autism or intellectual disability and language or reading disabilities, and then a severe group, severe autism or intellectual disability or AAC. So the results I'll present today will will show the, based on these three groupings. So depending on the site, we had more or fewer respondents. Um, Stefka and her student at the time, Hilary Stahl, worked really hard and pretty proud that to have gotten so many surveys from Vancouver. So it varies depending on the site. And because there were quite a few questions and they had to answer for so many groups, unfortunately not all respondents answered all the questions. But we still have... Um, a pretty sizable sample if we consider uh, sites combined. So who were these people who answered? Mostly women age 30 to 49 with a wide range of occupations, all people who work with children or who were at sites that delivered ser services to children. And um, in most sites, only a minority of respondents said that they spoke more than one language at home except in Montreal where that was actually 91% of respondents. So what did we find? So I'm just going to orient you to the, the, the figures as they're presented. So uh, the figures present the data for the sites combined and at the end I'll tell you about some interesting site differences that we found. So on the bottom you have, on the, the bottom axis presents the range of responses for opinion from strongly agree to disagree and for practice from always to never. And there, there's the three groups of, of children that are presented here. So this first result was a question that asked people whether they thought children can learn more than one language. So I think that's interesting to interpret the other results to start here. So we see that, oh, and I should also tell you that counterintuitively, for, for opinion, smaller bars mean more agreement. So here, uh, what we can see is that for all three groups, respondents were generally in the strongly agree to agree range in terms of whether they thought children were able to learn more than one language, with a, a decline from typically developing to children with mild or severe disabilities, but respond, mean responses still maintain in the agree range. So generally, a, a situation where respondents said they thought they could learn. Okay, the next, these next slides are, are going to, to juxtapose practice and opinion. I'm going to start with the practice, which are the dark gray bars here. And this is a question that was about sequential bilingual children, so children who have a home language that is different from the language of instruction and who are going to learn the language of instruction a bit later on. So 
This was about whether or not these children are actually receiving services to support the language of instruction in, the, in where these, the respondents were working. So that would be support for English in most of the sites and support for Dutch in the Netherlands. So in terms of whether children were receiving these supports, what we can see is that even for typically developing kids, it's sometimes. So that's partly due to the variability across sites, but it's also because, as we saw in many sites, it depends whether a, a child um, might be able to access that or, or actually might need it. So there's not really very much variability depending on the group. When we asked people whether they thought children should receive these services, so now focus on the light gray bars, we see that it's all in the agree range. So children are only sometimes receiving these services and respondents generally feel that they should. Not very much variability as you see depending on whether or not we're talking about typically developing children or children with mild or severe disabilities. For these next results, we actually combine the results for children who were sequential bilinguals and children who were simultaneous bilinguals because they pattern the same. And we asked respondents whether or not children were exposed only to English or to Dutch in the Netherlands in their workplace. So that would mean that children would be either receiving, uh, participating in, in therapies that are only in English or in school not accessing uh, uh, classes where they're learning other languages. So essentially, or in, pre in preschool's context where everything is happening in only English or Dutch. So respondents said that this was happening frequently, so that uh, monolingual, monolingual contacts were actually frequent. Again, there isn't much if any difference when you combine the sites in terms of the three different groups of children. What did people think about that? So here we can see that they're in, the responses were in the neutral to disagree range. So when people are asked whether children should be exposed only to English in terms of um, schools or therapy or preschool context, most of the time people say, well, it depends, but they're in the neutral to disagree range. So they're actually more open to some opportunities for uh, other languages being present uh, than what the, the situation reflects. All right, the last set of results that I want to share with you were about optional second language learners. So children who have the same language at home as a language of instruction and whether or not they, they part, are able to participate in language classes. So here we're not talking about immersion but language as subject matter. So if you're in school and you have at some point opportunity to learn another language, Spanish or German or English or I don't know what else. Um, Mandarin. <laughs> and here what we see is that there's a decline between what the situation for typically developing children who are, are frequently in that context to mild, uh, for the mild group where it's now edging its way towards sometimes, which is the situation for children who have severe developmental disabilities. Now, this might not be surprising and uh, in many ways could actually make sense. So we see that there, there is a decline here. And when we ask people what they thought about that, well, we see the same pattern where for typical children, generally people are in agreement with this, and that's the same for my, children with mild impairments, but there's a less agreement for children with severe impairments. But again, we're still on the left side of neutral. 
So it's not that people are opposed to this, but there's, they're, I guess they're starting to be more in, in, the, in the pens range, and we see a difference in opinion depending on, on the, the group of children. So what does this all boil down to? So to summarize, people generally responded in, uh, in ways that suggest that they think that children with both mild and severe disabilities are capable of, of learning sec a second language, at least in certain contexts. And although their opinions were more neutral about this for the latter group, the overall picture that emerges one where there's a disconnection between opinion and practice, where, and this suggests that the needs of bilingual students with developmental disabilities are not adequately being addressed, at least some of the time, and fits with what, some of what we saw in the policies, where uh, there isn't always recognition of this situation where children with developmental disabilities are growing up in bilingual contexts and might need additional supports for that to, to happen. I wanted just to tell you about a couple, a few interesting site differences that we found that are, I think, are explainable, but speak to the importance of context. So, if we take Albuquerque, so in Albuquerque, there's actually a large group of uh, Spanish-speaking, uh, popula a large Spanish-speaking population, and there's also some um, First Nations groups as well, and in Albuquerque, and there's also, contrary if we think about Vancouver, it's a large group of bilingual English-Spanish speakers, both in terms of who the clients are, but also who probably the, the respondents were. And we found in that site that there, the opinions in support of increased bilingual services and availability were among the strongest. And 44% of, of respondents spoke a second language. And bilingual services are really highly defined and overseen by policy there. So they're already in place. A lot of the people are bilingual, and a lot of, of the children are, are bilinguals, but in some more restricted groups. So that makes it possible for them to already be doing, doing, some, doing some things that aren't necessarily frequent in other sites, such as doing bilingual assessment or bilingual interventions. In Halifax, where if you remember that first graph I showed you, that was the site with the, the lowest uh, proportion of, of speakers of other languages. English only exposure assessment and treatment was most common at that site. In Montreal, there was often a, not so much of a gap between practice and opinion. So that's a bit similar to uh, the Albuquerque context, where a vast majority of survey respondents, 90 percent, said that they spoke French and English, uh, that they spoke more than one language regularly. And we know that that's also the case for many people in that city. So that makes it also m perhaps more possible to have uh, a situation where practice and opinion are, are already more closely aligned. In Vancouver, there was actually often a steeper decline in opinion and practices between typically developing children, children with mild and severe disabilities. And that's in a context where we know that there's already quite, you know, widespread access to language classes and quite a bit of, of immersion. So uh, people both as practitioners uh, as practitioners, will have had quite a bit of experience with, with uh, children who have developmental disabilities and are, are growing up in bilingual contexts and might have been accessing these services. So there's some interesting differences, but overall, there were really more similarities or commonalities than differences. There was considerable agreement regarding for both practice and opinion across sites that's suggesting that access to bilingual services and supports are not as adequate as they could be for children with developmental disabilities and that this places them probably at some level of higher risk. It was actually interesting and you know, uh, reassuring to find professional opinion that was generally aligned with available research regarding uh, 
prior, prioritizing the learning of language of instruction and promoting better access to bilingual supports. And compared to prior research, we found more support for bilingual education opportunities than have been previously reported. So if we put the pieces of the puzzle together here, the policy piece and the survey data that was told us about practices and, and opinions, it seems that across sites there's, there are accommodations in place for children with developmental disabilities, but those accommodations are much more about uh, developmental disabilities than about bilingualism. And so it, there really needs to be an, an acknowledgement that these two things coexist and that these are not, it's not rare for children to be with developmental disabilities to be growing up bilingually. There doesn't seem to be the same access to service for these children and professionals seem to see this as a problem and a, a necessity to have more supports for them. So that suggests that we probably need changes in policies and programs. But we also need to acknowledge that we still need more research because some of this research hasn't been done. So what would be the impact of, of having more support for the language of instruction in terms of outcomes of children? How could that be actually realized? Um, who would offer that support? What intensity does it need? Um, would, it, would it make a difference if we supported the, first, the minority languages more, for instance? and knowing more about who's attending which programs. So I'm going to soon uh, let Stefka take over here, but I just wanted to let you know that if you wanted to know more about this study and the parts of it that I didn't talk about and these parts, so the, the lit review and the interviews, uh, there should be an upcoming issue in the, a special issue in the Journal of Communication Disorders that we'll talk about all the aspects of the study, and I give you that info in your handout. Multi-site, multi-researcher. So um, these were all the, the, the researchers involved at the various sites, and we also need to thank our numerous RAs and, the, the, and our funding source, which was SHRC. So now that we've considered policies and practices and opinions about children who grow up bilingually, we can ask, what do we know about how that plays out? And Stefka is going to tell us a little bit more about what we know. So as Paula just presented on this large um, scale study that we've conducted across different sites, what's really striking is the difference between uh, practice and opinion. I, I hope you notice that. So often practitioners um, or specialists are thinking that what is actually being done in their school or professional setting is less than what they would ideally like to see done um, when dealing with children with special needs who are also bilingual. Just a little overview again is that um, knowing about the research on bilingualism and children with special needs, um, before I go further I really like this quote from Kathy Connard who is one of the um, well-known people in the field who's done a lot of research on children with special needs and uh, bilingualism in particular. And what she says is that bilingualism does not cause language disorders or delays and imposed monolingualism does not cure them. Um, so keep that in mind. If you don't remember anything from this talk, if you remember that, I think you're doing well. Um, and we also know from numerous studies now, they're accumulating every month, um, that there's no evidence for negative effect of bilingualism on the children's language abilities um, in populations such as with specific language impairment or Down syndrome. Um, we also know that from research that when we compare bilingual children with language impairment to typically developing bilingual children, um, obviously the children with language impairment tend to have a slower rate and less success in the language acquisition process. But when we compare bilingual ch children with language impairment to monolingual children with language impairment, we generally find that both groups go through the same rate and have the same degree of success in the language learning process. Specifically focusing on children with autism, which I think is probably mostly what you're interested in. Um, similarly, the research, um, which has been accumulating for the last five years, believe it or not, about five years ago, there wasn't a single study published on bilingual children with autism. Uh, but the newer evidence is now showing, similarly, that there's no differences between bilinguals and monolinguals with autism. And this is in terms of when we compare their age of, um, at which they go through the main language milestones, their equivalent, 
Um, when we look at their early receptive and expressive vocabulary, they tend to be about the same size. Um, early morphology and syntax, so ability to produce proper sentences, again, seem to be equivalent, and social communication skills. So focusing specifically on one study, which was done by Kaori Hashi, who was a master's thesis student of Pat Miranda's in this program, um, she looked at particularly the development of early morphology, syntax, and social communication. And this is just showing you the comparison, the means between the bilingual BE and monolingual ME, or bilingually exposed and monolingually exposed children. Um, and in terms of the age at which they produce their first words, or the age at which they produce their first phrases, there were no significant differences between the two groups. So the, both the bilingual and the monolingual children were achieving those at the same rate. And their communication scores were similarly equivalent. And in the different study done by Jill Peterson, who was a thesis student of mine um, and collected data on Chinese English, um, speaking bilingual children who are, um, and all of this research I should have mentioned so far is done with preschool students. So these are all children who are fairly young or up to the age of five. Um, and she compared their Chinese and English vocabularies and, and both in terms of CDI scores. Do you, are you familiar with CDIs? So those are MacArthur, it's called the MacArthur um, Child Development Inventories, which is a checklist um, which is usually completed by the parents. So it's designed for children from the age of almost zero to the age of three. So we're talking about young babies, um, typically, that the mothers are then checking on the checklist words that they think the children are able to comprehend or understand, and words that they know that their children are able to produce. So we can look at both language comprehension and production. It's a nice sort of checklist which gives you a sense of um, the size of their vocabularies. Um, and when we compare the children's, especially the yellow bars and their English um, CI scores of, of the bilingual and the monolingual groups, they were not significantly different. Um, similar in PPVT, it's a Peabody picture, picture vocabulary test, which is a receptive test of receptive vocabulary. Children are shown four pictures, given a word, and they're asked to point to the picture that represents the meaning of that word. Um, when that was done in English, similarly, there were no differences between um, the bilingual and the monolingual groups. And we now know there is a study by Villasenti, McDermott, and co-authors which are suggesting that there might be possible advantages for bilinguals with um, autism. Um, it was a retrospective study of 80 toddlers, 40 monolinguals, and 40 bilinguals who are English, um, Spanish English speakers. The study was done in the U.S. Um, and what they found basically was that um, the bilingual children tended to be more likely to vocalize and utilize gestures uh, when there were no other differences between language and cognitive skills between the two groups. Um, and there were also no differences in cognitive functioning and autistic features. So those findings were on gesture were very similar to findings reported by others with typically developing populations. And we know generally that bilinguals tend to gesture more than monolinguals for whatever reason. So we see that same pattern in children with autism who are bilingual. So the first study that I want to present to you today um, from our lab is done by Tracy Lamp, who was one of my master's students, um, and it focused on pragmatic skills of bilinguals and monolingual children with autism. Um, why focus on pragmatic skills in particular? Um, and in this case, we actually uh, focus it especially on narrative productions is that the notion that narratives are actually providing context in which children can are forced to sequence, provide a sequence of events, and also to structure them in a way so they can represent um, their own particular perspective. So whether they present it through their own perspective or that of some of the characters. As a result, that kind of task puts cognitive, linguistic, and sociocultural um, requirements and expectations on the children, and therefore they have to represent or show that they have that knowledge and ability. And as you may know, autism undercuts competence in all of those areas. So narratives are a good resource or a good area to look at um, um, performance of children with autism. We also know from research done on monolingual children with autism generally that <clears throat> when we look at their narrative abilities, and we compare them to typically developing children, we find that the children with autism tend to have more, uh, use more ambiguous pronouns. So usually, if you're familiar with narratives, when you introduce a character, you say the boy and the frog went out for a walk, and then he jumped. 
Um, so in a good narrative, we have to make it really clear who the he refers to. So in this case, if there's two male characters, the boy and the frog, if you say a he, it will be unclear as to what this pronoun refers to. Um, you, and if you're aware of that, you need to make it clear. Uh, if it's a boy and a girl, a brother and a sister went out for a walk and she jumped, you don't have to make it clear because by using the proper pronoun, it's already clear who it refers to. Anyways, children with autism tend to have, young children generally have difficulty with pronoun, what's called pronoun reference, but children with autism have much more so than typically developing children. Um, they tend to also make fewer references to a character's emotions, which is again not very surprising. Um, so how they feel, or uh, and similarly also um, actually a theory of mind and, and mental words, so mental verbs. We know that children with autism tend to not use as many of the words such as he believes or he thinks or he feels. Um, they tend to have lack of causal statements, so things like he did this because or this is what led to um, him doing that. Um, and generally their narratives tend to be of shorter length, so they produce shorter narratives than typically developing children. So for this study, our main goal was to determine whether there was a difference in pragmatic skills between bilingual and monolingual children with autism, because to our knowledge at that point, there wasn't a study done in this particular area of um, children, bilingual kids with autism. The data was retrieved from a large data set, which is um, the Pathways in Autism Spectrum Disorder, which is again a national, cross-national um, pro research project, longitudinal project, and Pat Miranda is the main investigator from BC. Um, so she shared, this is actually pre-collected data, so she shared and made the, her data available to us to specifically look through it and find um, 20 or 22 bilingual individuals who met our um, selection criteria, which in this case was that the children had to speak and understand two languages at the age of eight and a half to nine, which was the age at which they were tested. Um, and they had to be exposed to languages since at least the age of almost six or younger. So they should have been exposed to two languages for at least three years, basically. And the monolingual children um, had to speak and understand only one language and no reports of exposure to any other language since birth. Children were of the two groups were matched on age, language ability on some subscores uh, of the self, which is a language battery measure, um, standardized measure, nonverbal IQ, we used the WISC, and autism severity, the ADOS. And in terms of the measures on which we compared their performance, we used the children's communication checklist, which is basically a checklist which is completed by parents, um, comprises of 10 different scales that assess different areas of communication skills. Um, and then really the main, um, the main measure of interest is the expression, receptive, and recall of narrative instrument, or the ERNI, uh, which asks typically asks a child to tell a story while looking at some pictures, then answer comprehension questions based on the story that they just produced. So in terms of results, um, uh, when we looked at the Ernie and specifically the Ernie outcomes, um, green bars are monolingual group, the yellow bars are the bilingual group, um, and we analyzed um, their narratives, so the narratives that they produced in the context of the urn, in terms of the frequency of the causal statements for utterance, we find that there were no differences between the two groups, statistically, statistically significant differences between the two groups. Um, in terms of the frequency of use of evaluative devices, which are again similar things such as mental verbs and emotion, words expressing emotions or relating to emotions or um, character speech and anything that makes the narratives more interesting and engaging. Um, again, there were no significant differences between the two groups and the proportion of character reference errors. Um, so again, ref um, the pronoun, pronoun references, there were no differences. Um, in terms of number of the main IV ideas conveyed or comprehension questions and the way they were addressed, again, there were no, although the bars are somewhat looking differently, they were not statistically significant. And finally, if you remember, children with autism's narratives tend to be of shorter length than those of typically developing children. When we looked in terms of length measures, such as mean length of utterance, so how long, this is actually a measure of how complex or how long their utterances are, and, and in some way it gives us an idea of their how sophisti sophisticated their grammatical knowledge is. There were no differences. When we looked at lexical errors or grammatical errors, similarly, they made approximately the same proportion. So in discussion of this particular study, we found that there were no differences in the measures of pragmatic skills between bilingual and monolingual 
bilingual children with autism who are at school age, um, eight and a half to nine years old, uh, which is consistent with previous research with younger children with ASD, which I presented briefly already. And it supports that bilingualism does not impede language development in children with ASD, especially in this particular domain, as well as the others. The second study uh, focused on examining executive functioning behaviors in bilingual and monolingual children with ASD. Uh, again, a thesis student of mine, Stephanie McCaro, conducted that as her thesis. So, does everybody know what executive function is? Some people are nodding, some are not. Okay. <laughs> um, they're usually the skills that are needed to complete a particular goal-oriented task. So they're sort of frontal lobe um, skills um, that we kind of need to, to use on a daily basis, and they're, therefore they're crucial for the proper development of children and maintenance of cognitive, social, psychological, physical, and emotional self-control. Um, so some of the four main um, executive functions that um, we were interested in examining, but also people have explored in the research, are first cognitive flexibility, or also known as mental flexibility, shifting or switching, um, which is basically the ability to switch between two perspectives or between um, one situation to another. Um, inhibition is the second one, which is basically defined as engaging in self-control and the ability to suppress impulsive behaviors. The third one is working memory, or the ability to keep things in your, in your head while you're performing something else in a short duration. And the, and the fourth one is planning, which is basically the ability to generate um, and sequence thoughts and to be able to order actions for future events, um, as well as to be able to monitor and update steps depending on the situation. So you can see how those are really key fun fundamental skills that we all need on a daily basis at all times. Um, and we know that um, deficits in executive function have been found in all four of these areas um, for individuals with autism in terms of monolingual populations. Um, <clears throat> On the other hand, um, there has been a line of research with typically developing bilingual children that's been showing um, that there is a possible bi bilingual advantage in executive functioning for typically developing children. It's a work which mainly conducted by Ellen Bialystok and students and collaborators in her lab in Toronto, York University. Um, and the argument here is that why would bilinguals have advantages on executive function is because by being bilingual, by being forced to typically function in two languages and switch between the two languages on a daily basis, it leads to the mental control that is needed to be able to switch back and forth efficiently um, and also forces you to, um, to have selective attention. So often you have to, if you're speaking French in sort of typically an English dominant environment, you need to suppress the English and try and focus on the French because that's the language in which you're currently communicating. Um, and um, I just have to note that even for the last 20 years, this research has been growing and sort of been becoming quite influential. But recently, in the last three or four years now, people have started questioning um, the bilingual advantages of this executive function because newer studies are coming out where they're actually not finding <coughs> particular advantages for the bilingual population. So now it's quite a heated debate in the area, but um, um, it's still worthy of pursuit, I think. <laughs> um, also, my own perspective is actually talking to people about this, um, about this topic and sometimes people feel very passionate that, oh, you know, of course there's advantages for bilingualism and you shouldn't dare suggest anything else, um, when in fact is, we can argue about it, but the, the point is that for me is, so far what we know from the research is that bilingual individuals have advantages on sort of very artificial laboratory tasks. So usually the tasks are um, on a administered on a computer and press the left button when the picture appears on the left hand side or press the right button when and that's all. And then we know that bilingual kids tend to be faster at those tasks or more accurate at those tasks. But for me, a true bilingual advantage would be something to be able to say, well, as a result of those executive functions, this child is actually able to function more effectively or more successfully in real life. And what is real life? Well, they do better in academic and they'll do better in school or they'll have more friends and they'll be able to communicate more efficiently. 
then I'll say, okay, yeah, I agree, there's a bilingual advantage. And so far, that research has not really been done. Um, and this is where we wanted with this study to go a little bit a further step behind and try and see whether there's a link um, between executive function and academic achievement. So again, these are school-age children, so for them, obviously, successful functioning would be, be doing well in school. So if their executive function scores are also similarly linked to um, their academic performance. And from research done with monolingual children, we know that typically strong executive function skills tend to be fundamental for successful academic performance. And also research has found that um, executive functions tend to be linked to both math and reading skills in school um, for monolingual typically developing children. So the research question for this study was, uh, there were three research questions. Obviously, each one linked to each of the aspects that we're interested in. So first, we wanted to see whether there are differences between the two groups in terms of executive function. Um, second, we wanted to see whether there are differences between the groups in terms of academic achievement. And finally, we wanted to see whether there was a relationship between executive function and academic achievement. The participants came from the same database, um, the same um, Pathways project. Um, and again, they were of the same age group, although they're not necessarily the same kids as in the previous study. Um, same selection criteria same, matched on the same variables, so I won't trouble you with that. Um, so the measures of executive function came from a standardized measure called the Behavior Rating Inventory of Executive Functions, or otherwise known as BRIEF, um, which comprises of a parent and or teacher report. So again, it's not an actual experimental measure. We are, we're relying on parent or teacher reports where they had to check and respond to um, things such as inhibition. So for example, does the child blurt things out? Um, shift would, an example, would be acts upset by a change in plans. Emotional control, mood changes frequently. Initiation is not a self-starter. Um, working memory forgets what he or she was doing. Planning understands time needed to finish, um, underestimates time needed to take tasks, finish tasks. Organize, organization of materials leaves a trail of belongings wherever he or she goes. And monitoring does not check work for mistakes. So those are the kind of items and things that the parents had to check on whether that's occur, whether yes or no for their child. For measures of academic achievement, we used the Wexler Individual Achievement Test, um, where we looked specifically at word reading, which includes subtests, um, which focus on <coughs> phonological awareness as well. Does everybody know what phonological awareness is? No? Phonological awareness is um, the ability to identify sounds in spoken language and map them onto real, eventually map them on, on, onto letters. And similarly, identifying the sounds that the letters make and being able to combine them. As, as you can see, that's fundamental required skill for um, learning to read and write in an alphabetic language. Um, also, simple word reading, simple non-word reading, um, letter sound correspondences, and things like that. In terms of numerical operations, similar children were asked to um, do things like addition, subtractions, multiplication, division, as well as identifying numbers. In spelling, they were asked to spell simple, um, simple words and letters. Oh, this is really small. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, the results are basically across on executive function measures, on the academic achievement measures were always statistically not significant. Um, so I'm not going to present all of the different um, subtests. This is just a table which shows the subtests and as well as the um, cumulative scores that you can get um, from the standardized measure on executive functioning. And basically, if you can look at the means of the monolingual and the bilingual children, again, they're statistically not significant. Um, and the bolded numbers, which are all of them but the one here on shift, are their lower means, which means the children are doing better. Um, so the fact is that their bolded is indicating that those are the measures on which bilingual children have slightly better scores than the monolingual children. So again, they're not statistically significant. We can't make a big deal out of it, but there is a potential that across all of those measures, the children tended to have better scores, um, which kind of gives us an impetus to continue exploring further this area with maybe different measures, experimental measures, or with larger more um, more subjects and figuring out whether that indeed is actually might become significant or present. 
And in terms of the association, so if you remember the third question was looking at association between executive function and academic achievement. We simply looked at correlations between executive function and academic achievement measures separately for bilingual and monolingual children. And what we found, um, which is kind of interesting, was that the bilinguals, there were only two significant correlations between their achievement um, scores and um, particular subtests on organization of materials from their executive function. And again, achievement in terms of reading scores and their ability to inhibit were the only two statistically significant um, correlations, which as you can see from their magnitude, they're really um, me um, medium strength. They're not very strong, but still present. Um, well, on the other hand, for the monolinguals, there were ton lots of the correlations were statistically significant, which was quite striking that there was this difference between the two groups. And for now, we don't really have an explanation as to why that is, um, but it's something interesting and was certainly um, worthy of more investigation. So in conclusion for that specific study, um, we again find that bilingual exposure doesn't seem to be detrimental to the executive functioning or the academic performance of um, bilingual children with autism. We found no differences between the two groups on executive function tasks or measures of academic achievement. And again, this different association between executive function and academic achievement between the two groups is still an interesting unknown and worthy of future research. So in terms of general conclusion, um, today we saw that children with autism, again, hopefully if you remember one thing is that you remember this message is that they can be successful bilinguals. Um, the evidence is showing that bilingualism is not hurting them. Remember, it's not, um, and imposed monolingualism is not going to cure whatever um, there might be. Um, and therefore, it's also really important to consider the parents' values and opinions and feelings and attitudes um, about their child's language abilities and also what kind of educational priorities they should have. Um, as far as we know, autism does not present differently in bilingual children than monolingual children. And we know for other clinical populations that because there's, as far as again, as far as I know, there hasn't been um, intervention research on bilingual kids with autism. But in other clinical populations, bilingual intervention tends to support bilingualism socially and therapeutically for those children. And finally, from the bigger study, we also know that children have limited access and support um, to language programs in schools. And it will be better to actually uh, open. So the opinion was that we need more access and to open more opportunities for those children. And also we noticed that severity tends to play an important role in decision making for on, at the administrative level. So whether there was a mild versus severe um, disorders, that tended to make a difference in how people thought about um, those children. Thank you.